Hello. We're slowly trickling in. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the sustainability speaker series. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of people coming in now. We've opened the doors. Good to see everybody. <clears throat> even if you're just a long list of names right now. <laughs> um, my name's Megan. I'm the one of the programming librarians at the Saskatoon Public Library. We're located on, uh, all the libraries are located on Treaty 6 territory. And I'm in my apartment right now, which is also located on Treaty 6 territory in Saskatoon. Um, and, before we get started, I'll do a few housekeeping things. If you have a question that comes up while you're watching the presentation that you want answered, we're going to have a question and answer period after Axel and Kathy both give their presentations. And you can put your questions in the chat box. So if you look at the bottom of your Zoom, there'll be a couple options to raise your hand and participants and stop video. And then there's also the chat. So you can open up chat and put your questions in there. And as I was joking before, if you need a glass of water, feel free to get up, move around, get one. If you need to go use the washrooms, mm -hmm. they are in your home. So <laughs> they are available out in the hallway, I imagine. And now I'm going to turn the speaker event over to Carol. Well, good evening, welcome. Um, tonight's event in the Sustainability Speaker Series will be on plant genetic diversity and its importance for food security. This presentation was originally planned in, for March of 2020. The Sustainability Speaker Series is hosted by the Saskatoon Public Library in partnership with the Saskatchewan Environmental Society. The Environmental Society delivers community education and outreach, undertakes research, and carries out demonstration projects that move us towards sustainability. We have been operating since 1970 on important issues such as sustainable energy and climate solutions, water protection, biodiversity preservation, and reduction of toxic substances in our environment. If you aren't already a member, we encourage you to join. You can always find out more about our diverse activities and how to get involved by checking out our website at www.environmentalsociety.ca. If you would like to receive email notification of events in the Sustainability Speaker Series, you can send an email to the Saskatchewan Environmental Society. The email address is info at environmentalsociety.ca. In your email message, ask to be put on the list of people to be notified of events in the Sustainability Speaker Series. Our speakers this evening are Axel Diedrichsen and Kathy Holtzlander. Axel Diedrichsen is curator at Plant Gene Resources of Canada, which is a division of Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. He is also a research scientist. He has a PhD in plant breeding from the University of Göttingen in Germany. Uh, in his research, he has evaluated the genetic diversity of flax, coriander, oat, wheat, and pulse crops. This evening, he will help us understand plant genetics and the importance of maintaining the genetic diversity of cultivated plants. Our other speaker is Kathy Holtzlander. She is Director of Research and Policy at the National Farmers Union. Kathy and her husband farm in Saskatchewan. Kathy will tell us about farmer-led and public plant breeding efforts designed to keep our food systems resilient. The title of this evening's event is Cultivating Diversity for Plant Security. Sorry, <laughs> Cultivating Genetic Diversity for Food Security. The um, first speaker is Axel Diedrichsen. 
Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I see there are 23 participants, so it's a very overseeable crowd. It's sad uh, that we are not, cannot be, uh, have a real meeting. It would be nice to have the atmosphere. So I'm looking in my computer here, but this is how it is. So I will try to share my screen. Does that work for you? You see Coming it? Coming through, yep, yeah, can definitely see it. Good. Yes, uh, my, I uh, gave the title to my presentation, Diversity of Cultivated Plants, Why We Care About It and How We Preserve It. I start with something all of us can relate to because this has to do with our daily bread. It also has to do with food security in the larger picture. I start with the question, what is wheat? That's actually a very big question. <laughs> I look only at it uh, from what we eat. Uh, uh, there are two principal types when you look uh, at wheat. There's bread wheat, uh, botanically triticum estivum, and then there's durum wheat, triticum durum. Uh, one is used for bread making. It's a little bit more soft in consistency, consistency. and every Canadian, uh, uh, for every Canadian, it's about 60 kilograms of wheat flour that are used. Uh, it's used for bread, for cakes, uh, pizza, mostly made from uh, bread wheat. And the other is durum wheat. Uh, this is for pasta, spaghetti. Uh, uh, it's also cultivated, grown in Canada. The climate here in, in Saskatchewan uh, is suited for it there. And about four kilograms of pasta are consumed by every Canadian per year. So it's quite some, uh, quite some wheat that we consume. This is the average of the population. It's very interesting if you then start wondering where actually did wheat come from? Uh, it came actually uh, uh, wheat uh, orig uh, originates from the Near East, um, the Fertile Crescent, uh, and then it spread uh, relatively quickly into Europe. Uh, and here uh, on the right side of the slides, you see several, uh, several species, botanical different species uh, of wheat. Uh, in, in the bottom, at the bottom, you see the wild uh, uh, progenitors of wheat uh, from those wild plants. Some people selected uh, uh, the first uh, cultivated weeds. And it's a major jump from those wild species to the cultivated ones. Uh, uh, they have larger grains, they don't shatter, so they are really uh, made to be grown in agriculture. And here on the bottom left, you see the fertile crescent. Uh, it has this half moon shape, uh, therefore, this name there. So 10,000 years ago. Now, uh, wheat in Canada. The first wheat was grown, uh, that's documented in 1605 in Port Royal. Uh, uh, in what is now Nova Scotia. It was a settlement by Samuel de Champlain. And today, uh, wheat uh, is produced mostly in the prairie provinces, and Saskatchewan actually is the uh, largest wheat producer. If you see that 43% per, per, of the Canadian production comes from Saskatchewan now. Maybe some of you have heard of red five wheat. Uh, there's, uh, this is a heritage cultivar, which is quite popular um, for certain, for artisan bakeries. Uh, you see in, uh, in Western Ukraine, they have the former province of Galicia. Uh, that was when it still belonged to the uh, Austrian empire. From there, a wheat, uh, uh, this red five originated, came to Gdansk, a city in Poland, entered a boatload, uh, was brought to Glasgow in Scotland. And there, uh, a friend of the farmer, David Five, 
uh, uh, got hold of some seeds and shipped, his to, shipped those seeds to his friend who had settled, who had homesteaded in Ontario. Uh, and then he grew those weeds out. He seeded them in spring and it was a winter wheat. So it didn't make hats. This is what winter cereals do when you plant them in spring. Uh, uh, it was only five plants that had it, so that would produce a seed. And then uh, the family cow came, uh, the cows came in and ran over it and started eating it. So uh, uh, the next slide, please. It's only due to the wife of Mr. Five, Jane Five, who, who got the cows out <laughs> and a few plants were safe. And this wheat then actually uh, 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 was good. It was early, was adapted and spread over all of Canada and also into the United States and helped also to open the prairies with this feature of being early, uh, being early and adapted there. So uh, you can see what all can be involved in, uh, uh, in developing a wheat cultivar. Next slide, please. I recommend you, by the way, to read this order, uh, Ode to David Five. There, you have the link on that slide. Uh, there, you can read the whole story, where we, where we well, uh, very eloquent uh, presented that. Now, a little bit more to botany of Canadian plants for food and agriculture. In Canada, there exist about uh, a little bit more than five thousand uh, species of higher plants. 25 of these species were introduced deliberately or by accident, including weeds and what, whatever. Uh, then we have 364 native Canadian species that have direct or potential use in crop development. That means they are genetic resources. In addition, uh, you already talked about that we are here on 26 uh, territory. The indigenous people here in Canada have used for thousands of years plants, 600 for 600 plant species, uh, such use for medicine, food, spiritual reasons is documented there. There were big crops also among those that the First Nations people had, corn, garden beans, squash, uh, sunflower, tobacco, they uh, were cultivated in big farms along the St. Lawrence River or in farm settings, you can say, uh, say along the St. Lawrence River uh, when the Europeans uh, arrived here. Next slide, please. So take, uh, for example, these uh, uh, indigenous plants, uh, several of them disappeared. Uh, and this is what sh is shown on the top three images. Uh, there maybe was some diversity for what reason ever it could be due to, in this case, uh, a culture disappears, then these, uh, uh, these varieties disappear. Uh, uh, the same happened, uh, can happen to the wild species. It gets narrowed down there. Then you have, uh, uh, you had quite some plant breeding activities. There are less plant breeders, less entities that, uh, uh, that engage in that. So that also can cause a decrease in diversity. So the, top, the top three pictures is the picture you see usually. The, the bottom three is the ones uh, I, I, uh, I augmented that a little bit because in fact, you have to realize maybe it started with a few uh, cultivated plants, but then many people got engaged and a lot of diversity developed. So this is to tell that this diversity of cultivated plants is actually a product of culture. Uh, and that's very interesting. That it's in our hands what we shape and what we do that in crop plants or in cultiv cultivated plants. The next slide, please. So how do we preserve this diversity if we think it's useful or what that? Uh, you have the traditional way. These are actually also the three sister crops uh, uh, from, that came from, from the Americas to Europe, uh, corn, beans, and squash. This picture is from Ukraine. It's a home garden or a, a bigger field actually in Ukraine. This intercropping system spread through all of Europe uh, very quickly uh, after there was communication between the continents. So uh, it can be preserved, this diversity on farm. Uh, it's very dynamic. Uh, plants are adapting to the environment. There's utilization, there's ongoing evolution. 
uh, there's interaction steady with farmers, with consumers. Uh, the stability uh, uh, you can wonder uh, it uh, uh, will will people continue to do this type of farming and work the second approach uh, that is what we do in gene banks also the gene bank here in saskatoon the ex situ conservation we say uh, and this is done by active gene banks we maybe things that were collected here while and we have many, this is, an, uh, this is oat, for example, we grow them in rows and try to preserve them as they were, we harvest them, we store them. So our focus is more static. Uh, we store them for long periods of time because we have many of them, we can't grow them every year. Our focus is on the con conservation and then we assess them, we make measurements so that we have information about the material, we generate a lot of knowledge knowledge in the, in the understanding of Western science, of course. We make publications, we work with others. We, our, mostly our clients is not, uh, in, not directly the farmer, usually uh, it's breeders or it's uh, research. Again, you can of course wonder, is this stable? What happens? What happens if our gene bank here burns down? What happens if we don't get funding for 20 years or, or you know, will we still have viable seeds despite having good storages? Uh, and then I show another uh, extreme here. This is a backup that we also use. We ship uh, uh, occasionally a small seed sample to a Svalbard. Uh, the Svalbard Global Seed Vault, maybe you have heard of that. Uh, that's in, in Norway, an island uh, north of Norway, uh, where we uh, send small envelopes uh, just in case. In case we have water damage or we lose an accession, we can retrieve it from there. They are stored in a mountain, uh, also cooled to minus um, 18 degrees Celsius, so we can retrieve samples from there. So that's the extreme of long-term storage of a diversity, you can say. Next slide, please. So here you see the Canadian Gene Bank in Saskatoon on campus. We just had our 50 years anniversary. Next slide, please. Here you see what we all preserve. Uh, uh, we have big collection is more than 110,000 envelopes with seats in them covering uh, uh, all important crops for agriculture. So a particular focus, 80% on cereals, but then there's forages, there's flax, uh, there are many legume crops uh, and so on. So you see uh, quite a diverse, it's a, botanically it's close to 1000 species we have here, a seed germplasm. Next slide, please. What do we preserve? We preserve modern uh, cultivars that were bred by breeders, for example, in flax, uh, McGregor, a Canadian flax cultivar. We have old cultivars, for example, wheat marquee that was developed by Canadian breeders early in the uh, 20th century. We have land races, material that is not so stabilized. For example, the red five I uh, showed you, the history. We have crop wild relatives. So these are wild species related to the crop plants, which can be useful for crossing and breeding. We have also some native Canadian germplasm. For example, we preserve also a seed germplasm, a backup uh, of Saskatoon berries here. Uh, the image shows you a wheat lines that we plant in the field for regeneration. Next slide, please. Here you see the storage area. We store for a long time. Uh, it's low temperature and low uh, uh, air humidity. Then we can do it in paper envelopes. And we have also long-term storage with minus 18 degrees Celsius, where the seeds really store for more than 100 years. They will have good viability. Next slide, please. What do we do here uh, at the gene bank? Germplasm storage, of course. Uh, uh, we do viability testing. We acquire new germplasm from Canadian breeders or breeding programs that are abandoned, whatever. Some collecting may happen here and there. Uh, so we, the collection is growing. There's research ongoing. Uh, we have colleagues here uh, at our, in our research center that do molecular research on the material we have in the gene bank. There are colleagues uh, very active at the University of Saskatchewan looking at disease resistances so that we have information about the material. 
we have colleagues that look in the quality, maybe there's something interesting to find. And then we do the morphological and agronomical assessments. Next slide, please. So then the regeneration and characterization, very important. About 3,000 accessions are in the field every year. Uh, maybe we can organize a tour if you're interested in summer. <laughs> then we can uh, show something or you can see something in the field. Uh, and then as everything is documented. It's uh, documented on the internet. So you can uh, look uh, into our collections uh, and you can make requests for germplasm. We uh, uh, see germplasm here from from our gene bank and also data associated with the material we have in the collection. Next slide, please. A key thing for us is distribution of germplasm. We uh, ship a lot. Our clients are plant breeders and researchers, also education uh, for education. It can be teachers, it can be university teachers, it can be school teachers. Uh, though they receive a small envelope with seeds, so they have the cultivar or whatever they are looking for, either for breeding or for research, for education, so they have the starting material. We don't supply to gardeners. We are not uh, there to supply to gardeners. There are other sources for that. Um, so it's only for these purposes. Uh, then we supply free of charge, but it's a small amount of seeds. Here below, you see how many seeds we have shipped. So it's um, since 2002, uh, more than uh, close to 90,000 accessions were, were shipped. In any year, about uh, more than 5,000 samples uh, we shipped to 67 uh, countries uh, all over the world where we have requests. You see it on the map there. Uh, most of the requests, so 75% uh, are from Canadian clients. Uh. Next slide, please. Why is Canada investing in this here? Well, uh, uh, it's food security. M for example, if you look at spring weeds, uh, I showed you this red five. This is in the background of nearly all modern uh, uh, wheat cultivars. You still have it in the background. Uh, there are others that were introduced. Uh, Ladoga that brought earliness was used. Uh, to create the, the big wheat marquee I talked about, hard red Calcutta, another one came from India, just showing that early on, uh, this is William Saunders, uh, it was realized how important it is to communicate with others, bring in material, check it out, and maybe you find something that is useful here. Canada was, of course, only settled, really, uh, uh, and agriculture started. They had to look uh, also what comes from other, other areas of the world. Another example is rapeseed, uh, which was developed very uh, much uh, after, during and after World War II, uh, and uh, Saskatoon was also very engaged in it, <clears throat> based on germplasm from Argentina and Poland. Lentils, uh, Saskatchewan is now the lar largest lentil exporter in the world, uh, and that started in the 1970s with... Um, Slinkard, maybe you heard his name at the University of Saskatchewan here. He brought in a lentil collection, 95 lines, something like that, and selected the first that were adapted here. A more recent story is Camelina, Camelina, an oil seed uh, that is now uh, an interesting culture. You can get Camelina oil here locally produced. Uh, uh, was only it is resurrected, a resurrected crop plant. It was only preserved in gene banks in Eastern Europe, you can say. This book uh, you see on the bottom, The Harvest of Gold, uh, has interesting stories about uh, crop development here in, uh, in, in all of Canada. Next slide, please. So we are not alone. There are many gene banks around the world. Uh, uh, they preserve uh, altogether uh, about uh, 7.5 uh, 7 million accessions there. 130 gene banks. Here is a small, the, you see is behind the big column there, that is USDA. The small column behind <laughs> that is uh, Saskatoon. Next slide, please. We have three locations in Canada. We have Saskatoon where we have the seed germplasm. I talked about that. We have Harrow, Ontario, where we have fruit germplasm, which is as orchids or plants preserved in Frederick, New Brunswick where we have uh, potato germplasm. 
Next slide, please. This I like to show uh, last uh, uh, September, I uh, visited once here, went to Vasca Zoo, a little bit north from Saskatoon, and only one afternoon I made a walk there. And these are all the berries. Uh, it's about, uh, well, it's 12, 12 different uh, botanical di different species I could find there. It's amazing what all uh, exists here. This again also relates, of course, to what was already used for thousands of years by indigenous uh, people. And there's a lot of knowledge about this. Uh, and it's a very untapped reservoir. And this is of relevance, uh, of course, for Canada, but even globally, there may be traits in these plants, uh, adaptation to early maturity, whatever, maybe frost resistances that are interest uh, for breeders from all over the world. Next slide, please. Yeah, I see a comment there. Top left is quite poisonous. <laughs> May still be a genetic resource. Of course, medical use <laughs> is included. Now, this series is called sustainability series. Uh, maybe you have heard of the sustainable um, development goals, uh, which were formulated by the United Nations in 2015. Uh, and these goals were uh, formulated for to be reached or, or progress be made to, uh, in 2030. And what we do here uh, in the gene banks relates in particular to, uh, to uh, the, uh, is related to food security, of course. Next slide, please. Here you see, uh, so we are part of an international uh, uh, net, uh, network. We work with other gene banks. Uh, we have bilateral gene banks. We work closely with the United States. We work, we have uh, uh, connections to the Ukrainian gene bank, to the Russian gene bank, the Scandinavian gene banks, the German gene bank. We have close cooperation with the University of Saskatchewan. We also work with non-governmental organizations in Canada, uh, like Seeds of Diversity Canada. Uh, there is another uh, organization called the Bauta Family Initiative on Canadian Seed Security. We also work with them. They work more on the on-farm side. Uh, maybe you recall the slide I showed there. We have regional red networks uh, network where we work with Mexico, the United States, and Canada together on a task force. And then we have the international context. Uh, um, uh, as I said, it, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations looks after the, uh, these sustainable uh, development goals to which we also contribute somehow with our activity amongst many others. Uh, next slide, please. So the key messages of my uh, presentation here, plant breeding is, uh, is an essential activity. Uh, because we have to adapt to climate change, changing crop usage, usages, changing economic practices, uh, changing maybe towards more local production that may be an outcome of the crisis we are going through presently. We will see that uh, for that you will definitely need uh, uh, genetic diversity. There. Genetic diversity from gene banks is essential uh, for plant breeding. There are many players who add to this uh, effort to preserve and also develop this uh, diversity. And uh, the, uh, the key message is that uh, biodiversity uh, relates to food security. Next slide, please. This shows uh, the team of uh, the Canadian Gene Bank. We are 12 people here in Saskatoon. I use the image from 2019 when we still could be together in reality and, and make a good, good uh, group photo there. And now we have this virtual reality. We also work to a large extent remotely now. It will not be possible to maintain, uh, to do all the work we have to do the virtually. This is a real world uh, uh, exercise. Uh, so thank you for your attention. So I was asked, then I pass directly over to Kathy. <laughs> Thanks, Axel. <laughs> That's a really interesting presentation. Uh, lots of, lots, lots of uh, great work that you guys are doing uh, over there at the uh, Seed Bank. 
So um, I'm gonna, uh, um, Megan, if you could put up my uh, presentation. That'd be great, thanks a lot. So, um, so what I'm gonna talk about, uh, if you could move to the next slide, is about how public institutions and farmer funding has supported plant breeding in the public interest and how this differs from the private sector's approach. The food system is facing serious challenges and I argue that these are best addressed through strong public plant breeding system with strong farmer decision-making and that is supported by public funding. So next slide. So as Axel uh, said, uh, and of course we probably all know that seed saving and selection goes back to the very earliest days of agriculture. As a result, farmers were the world's plant breeders for millennia. Farmers saved what worked best and over time crops improved. Seed was adapted to local conditions and the farming community's traditions, food needs, tastes and aesthetics. Their seed exchange and cultivation practices are embedded in the seed we have inherited. And this forms the foundation of future seed systems. And seed is a world heritage recognized by the United Nations International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, which Canada has signed. Next slide. So in the 20th century, our society's relationship with seed began to change significantly. Plant breeding became more intentional and institutionalized. This was due both to new knowledge from Gregor Mendel's study of how traits are inherited and a change in how governments viewed their role in regard to agriculture and farmers. Just before the turn of the 20th century, the Canadian government asked William Saunders to create a framework for agriculture research in Canada. And uh, Axel mentioned him also in his presentation. Saunders uh, proposed a network of experimental farms, each one focused on a geographic region to study its crops, conditions and farming challenges. Most of these experimental farms are still in operation as agriculture and agri-food Canada research stations and many of them became involved in plant breeding. So that map shows the locations of, of the uh, original experimental farms. Saunders' son, Charles Saunders, which uh, I believe is in that uh, photograph there, uh, was an early plant breeder and using experimental farm facilities, he bred Marquis wheat, a high quality milling wheat that matured 10 days earlier than other wheats, making farming on the prairies more successful. When universities were established, their agriculture colleges got involved in plant breeding as well. And farmers like Seeger Wheeler uh, also improved crops by diligently observing and selecting seeds from plants with desired qualities. Next slide. In the 1920s, the technique to create hybrid corn was developed in the USA. By crossing two different parent lines, the progeny could produce a vigorous crop with desirable qualities from each parent. However, farmers who saved and planted seed from hybrid crops found that the next crop was inconsistent with the less desirable characteristics from the parent lines showing up. Thus, it made sense to buy new hybrid seed every year. Producing hybrid corn seed was a good business. There was a reliable market and farmers were willing to pay higher prices. This was the beginning of the private seed sector. Later, when genetic engineering was developed, patenting the genetic sequences gave the private seed companies a legal mechanism to prevent farmers from saving seed and also allowed them to charge royalties. The necessity of buying seed every year allowed companies to raise the price of genetically engineered seed, particularly when non-GE alternatives were not available. And uh, if you, that graph might be a little difficult to see, but the line at the top, the one that goes up fast, that's genetically engineered canola seed. And the, the other lines near the bottom, that's non-genetically engineered uh, wheat and barley seed. It's the cost of seeding an acre. And uh, you can see how once genetic engineering and canola was, was established, the price of seed went up. While the cereal seeds, you can 
save them and replant them every year if you want to, and the price of those stayed down. So crops that are not easy to hybridize or that have smaller markets are still primarily bred through the public plant breeding system. So next slide. Private seed companies have used these uh, strategies to raise the price of seed and to link seed sales to the sales of other inputs, such as herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers. The largest companies have consolidated through mergers and acquisitions to the point that now just six corporations control over 60% of the global seed market. So the next slide, please. Here's a summary that contrasts the public interest versus private interest in plant breeding. And uh, next slide, please. Now I'd like to tell you about how farmers are involved in public plant breeding. You may have heard of checkoffs. This is a small amount of money that is collected when farmers sell their crops. The levy is sent to the Provincial Commodity Development Commissions can then invest in plant breeding and other activities related to their crop. The crop development commissions are run by farmers elected from among the farmers who grow the crop and pay the levy. Most of the money collected by checkoffs goes into research, including public plant breeding projects and institutions. Next slide. The Western Grains Research Foundation is another important farmer-directed funding funding body that supports public plant breeding. And next slide. Here is a map of the main Agriculture Canada research offices. There are also smaller Ag Canada research stations involved in plant breeding. Several universities and the provincial governments also do public plant breeding research. The Crop Development Centre at the University of Saskatchewan is one of the most important institutions for crop, cereal crop breeding. Next slide. And uh, another interesting plant breeding initiative is the participatory plant breeding by farmers. While farmers have been the world's plant breeders for millennia, this project is focused, a focused and intentional project where farmers work with breeders to develop cultivars that work well on their own farms. One of the goals is to select lines that work well with low input production systems, such as certified organic farming. The map shows locations where farmers are doing their own breeding as part of a project led by the University of Manitoba. While I'm focusing on field scale crops, such as wheat and oats in this talk, I'd like to mention that most of Canada's vegetable seed is imported. This is partly due to our short growing season making it hard to get mature seeds before frost, and partly due to our small market, making it a less profitable business. The Bow to Seed Initiative, which uh, um, Axel also mentioned, is working on both field crops and vegetable seed development through participatory plant breeding. And they aim to make Canada more self-sufficient in vegetable seed and to develop varieties that are more able to adapt to more uncertain growing conditions due to climate change. Uh, next slide, please. So now I want to tell you two stories that highlight the benefits of public plant breeding. Wheat midge resistant wheat and hairy canola. Only one has a happy ending so far. So wheat midge is a pest of wheat that can cause a lot of damage. The larvae feed on immature wheat kernels and result in a significant heavy yield loss in heavy infestations. Egg Canada researchers found that a variety of soft white winter wheat was resistant to midge and they began to study it. They found it had one gene that would cause the plant to produce a chemical that was toxic to the midge larva when attacked. The midge would stop eating and die. Once the midges were gone, the plant stopped producing the chemical. So there's no impact on the quality of the wheat when the kernels are mature. Through traditional breeding techniques, Egg Canada scientists were able to breed a hard red spring wheat, the kind used to make bread and most widely grown on the prairies, that has midge resistance. To ensure the insects do not evolve resistance to the chemical that the uh, resistant wheat uh, produces, seed is sold in bags that contain 10% midge susceptible varieties. 
This ensures that midges can still survive in small populations and are not pressured to adapt. Next slide, please. The wheat midge research was farmer funded and publicly funded. An Agriculture uh, Canada study in 2016 estimated that there was a 37 to one return on the value for the investment. In addition, farmers no longer have to spray for wheat midge, which has environmental and health benefits. Midge populations are falling as a result of these varieties. And even farmers who don't buy wheat midge resistant seed are protected as a result of their neighbors using it. Next slide. Now for the remarkable story of hairy canola. Flea beetles are a serious pest on canola. They overwinter as adults and are ready to feed voraciously when canola seedlings emerge in the spring. Flea beetle damage can be severe. One of the main strategies to deal with it is insecticidal seed treatments. Lindane was used until 2004 when it was banned as a human carcinogen. In the mid 2000s, neonicotinoid seed treatments were developed, then used on nearly all canola seed. Ecosystem impacts on birds and aquatic life are now apparent, and neonics are likely to be banned in Canada soon. Agrochemical companies have now developed another generation of insecticidal seed treatments. The flea beetle problem was recognized by Ag Canada Research back in the 1980s. A Winnipeg scientist noticed that they, don't, they didn't attack wild mustard seedlings, which have a hairy leaf surface. In the 1990s, uh, a team of Egg Canada researchers in Saskatoon, um, can you switch back to slideshow slide view? Oh, um, sorry. <laughs> Slipped right out. Okay. That's okay. Oops. I'm going uh, to. That was slide number 14, page 14. We'll do a quick review. Yeah. <laughs> Read fast. There we go. <laughs> okay. Next good, one. Thanks. Or is this good? Uh, I think we're still on this one. Okay. Uh, so um, anyways, uh, after discovering, uh, recognizing that the, the hairy surfaces of wild mustard seedlings seem to prevent uh, flea beetles uh, from feeding, in the 1990s, a team of Ag Canada researchers in Saskatoon began working on developing hairy canola, hairy canola. Their work was funded by Ag Canada and the WGRF and Provincial Canola Commissions. By 2005, the researchers had promising results. Testing showed hairy canola seedlings were resistant to flea beetles and some even more resistant than plants grown from neonic treated seed. The lead researcher also noted that the hairiness trait is a robust resistance strategy. It is more difficult for the insects to adapt to the physical hairiness than to a biological feeding deterrent. With hairy, hairy canola, farmers would not have to use insecticides for flea beetle at all. The hairiness would also protect canola seedlings from cold and windy conditions because of the hair's insulating ability. And by reducing evaporation would increase drought tolerance. By 2013, Ag Canada had developed a GE line that had the needed oil qualities and yield for commercial production. They offered it to canola breeders to commercialize, but they had no takers. Thinking that regulatory approval for a genetically engineered crop was the barrier, the Ag Canada team turned to breeding using traditional methods, including characterizing thousands of related stains, strains of Brassica um, from the Gene Banks collection. By 2017, some germ plant is available to the community for their work towards a non-epigenic hairy canola. But still, we have no hairy canola varieties for farmers to plant. The question is why? Next slide. So Ag Canada's final report on the hairy canola project stated, most of the major canola breeding companies are also chemical companies, some of whom manufacture chemicals currently used for flea beetle control. The lead researcher was informed that they would not likely be interested in developing technology 
if it compromised another aspect of their business. So in fact, over 95% of Canada's canola um, varieties are genetically engineered varieties owned by Bayer or BASF, two of the six agrochemical multinationals that control over 60% of the world seed market. There is an overwhelming rationale for use in hairy canola varieties in Canadian agriculture. Widespread adoption would reduce both crop losses and the pesticide burden on ecosystems. It would save farmers the expense and risk of using insecticidal seed treatments or sprays. A shift away from insecticides for pest control would keep flea beetles from evolving pesticide resistance, interrupting the pesticide treadmill requiring new formulations of expensive chemical solutions. The climate adaptation benefits of the tiny hairs could mean more successful crops and higher incomes for canola farmers in years with difficult growing conditions. Beekeepers are also keen to see an end to insecticide usage on the canola crops their bees visit. By removing much of the flea beetle's food source, its population would drop, which would also benefit vegetable producers and home gardeners who grow brassicas. The money saved would be in farmers' pockets to invest in their farms and spend in their communities. Next slide, please. The contrast between wheat midge and hairy canola stories shows how who funds and makes decisions about plant breeding and who controls the commercialization of new varieties affects the land, livelihoods, economy, community, biodiversity, and future prospects of farmers. As a society and as farmers, we are facing really big challenges. We need a food system that works for us not one that just works for the big companies that make money by selling expensive seed and inputs to farmers. So next slide, please. So I work for the National Farmers Union doing policy research on seed and other issues. I would urge anyone who is a farmer to join our organization as a voting member and anyone who isn't to join as an associate member to support our work. And if you are a farmer, I would ur urge you to complete the Canadian Food Inspection Agency's need assessment survey about our seed regulatory system. The federal government is planning to do a complete overhaul of these rules, and there is a big risk that new rules will favour even more corporate control over our seed. You can get a link to the survey by going to the website that is uh, the page that is posted there on the screen www.nfu.ca slash campaign slash save our seed. I'd also like to invite you to the NF University, a series of in-depth sessions on important topics. The next one, big data, big questions will be on February 25th and on March 25th, the topic will be seed. You can register for free at nfu.ca. So thanks very much, and I'm looking forward to your questions.